We'll just say a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Axionus nostros quesimus domini sperando proveni et juvando prosecure, ut contra nostro operatio te sempre incipiat e per te cepta finiatur, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Immaculate Mother of the Church, pray for us. Nos compolipia, benedicate vero. Just so you know, I'm going to try to find that prayer that I say, somebody was asking me after one of the classes what that prayer is in Latin. Um, I do have it somewhere in English, and I've meant since day one to bring it in English and say it in English, but I, I always neglect to find it and bring it. So I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to find it and bring it for next week. It's uh, basically, it's essentially a prayer to the Holy Ghost, just asking him to guide all of our actions um, to, to a good end. So it's a beautiful little prayer. Um, but since we're going to talk about Latin in the liturgy today, it, it also isn't necessary when, we, when, we, uh, when certain prayers are said that we actually are able to translate those prayers. It's, it's as long as we know what we're saying. That's the important thing. And knowing and being able to translate are two different things. But we'll get into it. Just kind of a, a oh, and also to just, just, just to mention, uh, we have class again next week. And then the week after that, which I believe will be April 2nd, there will be no class. I'll be away. And then we'll pick up again the week after that. So just, I think it's, I think it's April 2nd. Um, whatever that, that Tuesday of the first week of April is, there will not be a class that, that Tuesday. Uh, but then we'll pick up again that very next Tuesday. So we're here next week. Then we're off a week. And then there'll be another week. Uh, then, we'll, then we'll start up again right after that. So the second is Okay, so we're uh, so the April second, no class, and then we start up again on the 9th of of April. <clears throat> so just to recap, last week we started to talk about we got into church and uh, like furnishings in the church, things that are needed for the liturgy for the holy sacrifice. I think we talked a little about linens. I just want to add one little thing because I started getting rushed around that point. It's in, I, don't, I, did, I didn't find a picture to put in here, but it'd be interesting if I could show you. But in the liturgy, you can, if you, you can see sometimes, not sometimes, but that the priest uses over top of the chalice something called a pall. A pall is the same thing we call something that goes over top of a, a casket, things like that, right? Because we're dealing with a sacrifice. But uh, we didn't use that pall before. Actually, the whole linen itself that was over top of the altar used to fold over top of the chalice itself. So the corporals, uh, now that we have a corporal that's just there, so essentially we have four linens. I mentioned to you three linens. The altar has to be covered with three linens. But then there's a fourth linen because the chalice rests on a corporal. A corporal, it's another small linen about like this. Before they were quite large and they folded up over top of the chalice instead of having a pall. And then over time they started making this pall instead of having this, pulling the linen up over top of the chalice and everything else. Very interesting, these things, how they, if we track them back, we see all kinds of uh, differences in the liturgy, but you see actual organic development. You don't see things happening from one minute to the next. You don't see, you don't see people, or you don't see the church sitting down at table and deciding what we're going to do next. Um, what, what's, a new, what's a new thing we want to do in the liturgy? What's something to organize a little bit better? They didn't have committee meetings to talk about what to do in the liturgy. Over, over hundreds and thousands of years, we're only dealing with 2,000, but, but over all these years, it just organically developed from one thing to the next. The Latin has a little bit to do with that as well today, or at least it's a hypothesis, and we'll talk about that. Candles, we're going to talk a little bit more about today. The cross we'll start with. Um, I want to mention a few more things about the cross. Now, altar cards, these are something that are used for the extraordinary form of the Mass, but even the ordinary form, now we know the terms, right? This is These are terms that Pope Benedict gave to the liturgy when he gave the motu proprio summorum pontificum, what he was saying is the old mass, the mass that comes basically all the way back to the apostles, was never, uh, it was never uh, abrogated. It was never uh, not permissible to go to. It, 
they, they made it impermissible to go to, but it had never been actually like cut off or um, uh, abolished is the word. It was never abolished, but always a, um, a but the, the form of the Roman liturgy that takes us all the way back to the apostles, or so says St. Pius V. Um, to give a, but since we have two different missiles now, what he gives is a terminology that is not a canonical terminology. He gives a, ter a terminology to each form of the Mass. One he just calls the extraordinary form, which happens to be the Mass of the Ages. Uh, then the other one is the ordinary form, which is the Mass we use since 1970. But the canonical terminology would actually just be. Um, the in the in the in the Italian it said the stessa lex orandi lex credi the lex orandi so the same law of prayer we've heard those terms before lex orandi lex credendi the law of lex orandi law of prayer is the law of um, lex orandi lex credendi is the the law of prayer is the law of belief is what it means it's a common term that we use in liturgy in the church uh, but he said they have the same law of prayer so they have the you have these two different liturgies, though one's called extraordinary, one's called ordinary. Uh, by referring to them in that way, they're, they're supposed to be completely equal. They can be used anywhere indiscriminately by, by anyone. But of course, there are some, there are a couple differences there. I don't want to go into all of it. But So in the extraordinary form, there's the altar cards. Though if you go to England at some of the oratories, they do the, the, the new mass, the ordinary form. And they use altar cards. What happened with the ordinary form, that we'll get into this probably more later, is there were so many changes that happened at the beginning because it wasn't like there was an organic change. It just, um, uh, it was done at table in a lot of, uh, that's a kind of a saying they have in, Ital in Italy, a uh, fatua tavola. But uh, over, over a period of time, all these new uh, documents came out that kind of, brought the Mass into what it kind of is today, even though we'll talk about that too, how it keeps changing a little bit. But what the Oratorians did is they took the very first documents that came out, which were uh, considered a, you know, actual liturgical um, renewal, and they still had altar cards. So they still use altar cards without, they have a middle color card that they use in the center of the altar. They have one for the offertory when they're washing the hands. And then for the final gospel, they don't do that because it was, it was abolished. Um, so they, there are altar cards for that. But in the old, old liturgy, the extraordinary form, altar cards are necessary. So they're actually as something that have to be on the altar, and except for the case when there's a pontifical mass with a bishop, and then he uses a book. Relics are something that are considered. Now, we know that relics have to be part of the altar. They're buried in the altar, as we talked about last week. I think we talked about that when we looked at... That top altar there, it's got a hole. That's a fixed altar, as we talked about. And that means it's concrete that goes all the way to the ground. It's immovable in that sense, but also in the canonical liturgical sense. But you see there's a, there's a square there, kind of a hole. That's the sepulcher. That's where they would bury the relic of the saint, and then they would seal that. But there are other relics that can be used on the altar that are used basically for decoration. The Ceremoniale Episcoporum, that's a doc, that's a, a book that ex describes the liturgy that's used for bishops, but it's a very authoritative uh, description. And one of the, uh, the one that we tend to use for the extraordinary form, it dates back uh, to the 18, like 1850s, something like that. But it says about relics is they're to be used on feast days as flowers are used. That's basically all, all that it says. A lot of places now uh, want to keep them on the altar all the time, which is okay, uh, except you're not supposed to have exposed relics if they, if they don't have a candle lit by them at all times because you're dealing with the remains of a saint who's in heaven. And so we honor those relics. We don't just leave them out and let them sit there and collect dust. If they're exposed, they have to have a candle burning next to them at all times. Or you'll see at some parishes where they'll cover them, since they don't have a candle burning at all the time. They'll, they'll cover them uh, to, be, to be respectful of the remains of that saint. Flowers, we'll get to. So the cross, I think I read this last week. Did, did you all see this last week? 
Did we stop? Okay, I think we stopped maybe here. So the cross must be on the altar to remain, or to remind, and to place before the eyes of the celebrant and the faithful there present the passion of Christ, of which the Mass is a living picture and the true representation. The altar represents uh, Mount Calvary, and as Calvary, it should be adorned with the cross to which, while celebrating the Mass, the priest must often raise his eyes, bow, and make genuflections. It says, like, especially at the offertory, now in the extraordinary form of the liturgy, it's very precise when and what the priest has to do. This is where you can see very clearly this is a sacrifice because you follow something called rubrics. Rubrics are all the writing that are in red uh, in the Missal. And that's where it gets the name, rubrics, because it's those things that are set in there that are red. Rubrics, rub, um, I don't know, ruby, but it, red comes, that, that's the same word. So I think it's ruby. I don't know what it is in Latin. But that's what it is, the, the, the red. So rubrics comes from the word, the red writing. Um, and so those are all the, in the Missal, when you open the Missal, you have all this red writing that's not supposed to be said at Mass. They're telling you what to do at Mass. They're the rubrics, kind of the official um, rules of telling you what to do. But they tell him when to raise his eyes, when to bow his head. We'll go through all that when we start getting into the Mass in the next couple of weeks with the, in, in the detail, the different points. Uh, especially at the offertory, it's one of the first times he raises his eyes up to heaven when he's offering the gifts up. He looks always to the up to heaven, to the cross, and then back down to the gifts. So uh, always bringing it back to these points. I want to talk about an a, a apparition some of you have probably heard about, the, the cross of uh, Caravaca. Anybody heard of the cross of Caravaca in Spain? Nobody. Nobody's read the book, uh, The Incredible Catholic Mass. I think that's what it's called, The Incredible Catholic Mass. Incredible Mass. Wonderful book. There was uh, Somebody was here last week. They were reading that. It's, um, it, has a, it gives a good description of it. What happened in the year, I think it was 1231, and I think this is during the reign of Ferdinand III, the great Cast, uh, Castilian uh, king. He was a third order tertiary a very holy man and an, an incredible warrior that won back most of Spain from the, from the infidels. He, during, during that time, there, was a, there were different uh, towns in, in Spain that had been taken over, you know, because in the 700s, most of Spain was conquered by the Muslims. And so it wasn't until the 1400s when the reconquest really pushed the Muslims completely out of their territory and allowed them to take over all of their towns again. But in 1231, there was a town where the, the, the Muslim prince or king that was there in charge of that town, he called everybody, he wanted to let the Christians go, but he, he, before he let them go, he brought all the Christians before him one by one and asked them kind of what they did. And the Catholic priest came before him, who was also a prisoner, and he was very interested in what the Catholic priest had to say. Uh, he asked him a lot of questions about things we believe in our faith and, and especially about the Mass, about this idea that he could call down God from heaven. And so he said, well, I'd like to see that. And so he said, well, well, to do that, there are things I'm going to need, and I'm going to need you to get. And he's like, well, prepare the list, the king said, and I'll, I'll get all of those things. Because there, there was a village not too far from them that was, it was run, it was, um, it was all Catholic there in that village, so they weren't under the control of the Muslims. So they, they sent word up there, gathered all the things that they could have, set up the altar and everything that was needed for Mass, and then the priest vested, and he noticed there's no cross. And so he was hesitant. He didn't know what to do. He didn't think he could say Mass without a cross. Now, that must blow our minds, because nowadays you go into a church, they don't have a cross. You can't find one in the sanctuary, or if they do, there's two iron beams that are, you know, on the wall somewhere, and that's supposed to be, I'm not sure what it, so he didn't have a cross, and now he's got the king there, and everybody, the whole court of the king, they're all sitting there, they're waiting for him, he's like, okay, so the king starts to think, well, there must be a problem with this guy, maybe he can't really call God down from heaven, and he asks, is there something wrong? Well, the priest says, the, 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 the cross, the cross isn't there, I, I don't think I can 
I can proceed if the cross isn't, isn't there in the Mass. And what was seen at that point in time at the vault of the, the ceiling was a very bright light, and the vault of the ceiling opened up, and two angels, now this is, this is witnessed by lots of people, and that cross remained afterwards. There was two angels that were bringing a cross down from heaven. It was a brilliant cross with all kinds of rubies and things all over it. And they brought this cross down, and they put it on the altar, and the priest is just sitting there with all this happening in front of him. And then one of the, and the angels stayed there for the whole mass, kind of like in a kneeling posture, if I'm not mistaken, supporting the cross. And one of the angels nodded to the priest that you could, you could, you could start. And so the priest said mass right there in front of uh, that, that cross and those angels. And afterwards the angels went up, but they left the cross there. And that's called the cross of Caravaca. I think the original cross was destroyed during the, during the Spanish Revolution that happened in the 30s, 1930s. And it had a, true, a relic of the true cross in it. Um, but still, they have, a, they, they, have a, a, they have something there today with a relic of the true cross in it that, they, that has replaced it. If I may be mistaken on some of these details. Um, the, the point is, is that all the things that are required for Mass, because it's a sacrifice and it's, uh, it's, it's divine worship of God, all of those things are necessary. We have an idea now in the last 40, 50 years that we can really kind of do what we want. If, if something isn't there, we can just proceed forward. In fact, I don't want a cross there, so I don't put one on the altar. I don't want candles there, so we're not going to use them. I don't like the tavaliola, the, uh, the, the linens that go on the, the, the altar, so we're not going to have that. In Austria, I went into some of these churches, they're the most splendid churches you, you've ever seen. And there's just no, there's no altar cloths. They just don't like to use those. There's no, there's no candles anywhere. There's not a cross to be, to be seen. Or it's hovering above, it, which traditionally goes back. They used to have that, that hovered above the altar, but the priest can't see it. He can't raise his eyes to it. It doesn't enter into the liturgy. There's a picture of the Cross of Caravaca. I think that's the, the one that replaced the one that got lost, or that's the original, I don't know. You can buy these. Actually, St. Juniper Serra, the one that founded California, the Franciscan friar that founded California, he kept one of these crosses with him at all times and was buried with it. So the whole time he was founding California, he brought it from Spain across the Caravaca. And when they exhumed his body in the 40s, they found it. It was still there on his chest. And I guess it's in a museum now. I didn't see it when I was out there. But. So that's the cross. Flowers, and this is... I could say a lot about flowers, but I'm only going to do this so we can move on. It's a beautiful quote from a Franciscan, I think he was a brother. God has left us from paradise three things. The stars, the flowers, and the eyes of children. Now that, that sums up why we would want to use flowers in the liturgy. Flowers are symbols of virtue. They're, um, there's something about the perfection of flowers. There's something in the sacrifice of picking the flowers. You're picking something beautiful only so it's going to die and be destroyed. It's, it's part of sacrifice and offering it to God. And we put it on the altar for His honor and glory. Light. Light sub gravis. It's a grave. It's under um, pain of a, It's grave not to have light in Mass, which means candles. And candles of pure wax. But I'll be criticized for that because it's not required anymore. It has to be... For the ordinary form, I can't remember what it is, but normally it has to be like 51% beeswax now. I think because it's difficult to come up with. But here's the argument that I've written down here uh, for why you would have pure beeswax for mass. So the candles, the wax should be of pure beeswax. Um, candles. Maybe that's supposed to say wax. I had to do this pretty quick today, so I, hadn't, I didn't get to read through any of these. So there's probably all kinds of... Wax candles are, okay, it's supposed to be wax there instead of was, sorry. Wax candles are, or we should say were, so strictly prescribed that not even the poor churches, may an exception, poor churches may have an exception, or may an exception be made. Now that's a decree from the congregation of, um, The Holy Roman Congregation is what that stands for. It's the Holy Office. 
they, they, they used to make all these declarations saying what you could and couldn't do. They would be the dubias. We've all heard of the dubia as of late, the Cardinal Burke and the others. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a Roman form, a Roman way of asking a question. And they would always have tons of these questions going into the, the, Holy, the sacred congregation, uh, the Holy Office. Can, you know, from this diocese, written in a dubia form, can we do this? And they would write back, say, positive, negative. They would just respond that way. It's a Roman way of responding. Um, and this is one of those things. Even poor churches, they must have candles. And they must have candles of pure wax before. Now, that would have been an enormous expense for them to have that. But that's how important it was to have these candles in Mass. Several congruent reasons, in addition to symbolism, fervor the use of beeswax. Beeswax is compared with uh, sterilin and or st st sterilin and, and, grat, and grease. Now, uh, what that is, is it's a... It's, it's like a pure, white, crystallized um, fat from vegetables or animals. But here we mean from vegetables that are coming from, it's a, it's a, well, it comes from the bees, but it's, it's something that comes from the, all the pollen and things. So it, it, it's a very kind of special type of um, compound. A noble product of vet, from the vegetable kingdom and is distinguished as such by, by its value, purity, and pleasant odor. Hence, wax has at all times been employed in the liturgy and has been donated by the faithful for divine worship. In this respect, the church will not allow any innovation. Now, there's been innovation now. Uh, Permissible in Italy, you almost can't find candles. They only use um, paraffin wax, the, the pourable stuff, and it actually just goes everywhere. It's so bad that I once poured it into cruets, not knowing they had. They were storing this stuff in water bottles, and it looks like water. And it was in the sacristy where you fill up the cruets. So I filled up the cruets with the, the this, this water, and then when Father went to make the offertory. Uh, he, he poured it in there for the offertory, but then when he washed his hands, he realized it was paraffin wax. So he had offered paraffin wax mixed with wine because they were, this, is the, this is the stuff they use. And they kept it in a, a, in a, 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 a what's it called, a pure, purified water bottle. And so it, I don't like this stuff. I don't like, from experience, I just don't like it. So the symbolism, when pure wax when using pure wax, it represents the God-man, Jesus Christ. The bright flame, which is above the candle, represents the divinity of Christ. The candle, properly speaking, his humanity, the wick con concealed within the candle is a figure of his soul. The wax itself, which is the product of the virginal bee, is an emblem of Christ's most pure body. And the symbolism can go on and on. St. Anthony of Padua talked about this at length. He always was talking about the bees and how, how miraculous the, 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 the work that these bees would do. But for all of these reasons, they would use this wax. Other reasons for using wax also, not wax, but for candles, there's something about it. You see it today. Everybody wants to have masses where they turn the lights off and light a bunch of candles. Uh, they where the parish that I'm by, they, they have those candlelight masses. It's just a normal mass, but they light a bunch of candles and turn, turn the lights off. In the extraordinary form, they have rorate masses, which have a kind of a deeper um, tradition to them, but it's the same thing. You're having a, a solemn, solemn mass with deacon and subdeacon, and you're singing, and you just turn the lights off, and you have all these candles lit. It's a beautiful thing. It goes back... But there's a, there's a grandeur to it to see all these all these candles lit. It's different than natural light that we use. It's very and it, it it adds an extreme beauty to, beauty to it. But then there's the uh, the idea of it being an oblation. You make this candle. It's difficult to make. First the bees do all this work, and then you've got to go through and process all that wax. Then you've got to take that wax and make a candle. I don't know if any of you tried to make candles. And I'm not talking about pouring the stuff into glass containers. Dipping the, dip the wick over and over and over again until you have a candle formed, and then burning it. So you send all that work and you destroy the thing. That's like a little oblation, isn't it? 
It's, it shows uh, what Christ's life was. It shows what uh, the sacrifice we need to make and the disposition we need to have in his service. Where that come? The lights also dispel the darkness. They remind us of the catacombs. So when we're at Mass, this is something that's very important. They remind us of the catacombs and days of the bloody persecution when they were having Masses in caves and in hidden places. In England, when they had to go into... Uh, when they had to go into hiding and they couldn't have people see that they were having mass in the house or they would raid the house and kill the priest. It was very grave. They had to have hiding holes. Maybe you've heard of them, the, the priest hiding holes. They were, these, uh, they were rooms inside the houses where they were almost impossible to find and they would shove the priest in there in a pickle. So the people would be raiding the house. They'd just shove the priest in there and shut the door and it would take them days of ripping the house apart before they could find the priest in this little hiding hole, the priest holes. If you want to learn more about that, there's a book called Hunted Priest. The Hunted Priest. True story written by Father, uh, Father John Jared, a Jesuit who lived through all that and had to escape after, um, after it became too impossible for him to work there in England anymore. And then they, his superiors told him to write a book about it. He escaped actually from the Tower of London. Uh, incredible story. So a great book for kids to read it because it's, very, it's a very heroic true story. Let's talk about churches. So today I want to get through many of these different things, and we'll get into the Latin. That, that'll be the, the majority of what we're going to talk about. So churches, and I'll go through it fairly quickly. There's a bit of dispute on how we get the shape of our churches and the kind of churches that we have, and in the end, we really don't know. Somebody will say they know, but most most liturgists and most theologians, don't. they don't really know. The our, our, archaeologists um, tend to have their opinions and things, but... We, we don't know. Some of the theories are this. They had basilicas. We've heard that word before, right? We have one here. They had basilicas in the Roman world. They were just really big structures that could hold lots of people. And some of their public buildings in the Roman Forum, where they did uh, the, a lot of the government work, they built these things that looked like basilicas, almost something that would have looked like what we have today, where the back, they had that rounded part there in the asp, uh, where and it was it was elevated where the, the 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 judge or whoever had to sit there to judge the people or do whatever and they had even like little rails and things like that they had steps going up some people say well, we got it from that others would say well we got it from uh, it actually came from Roman houses um, I, think, I think what they called them domus santa domus santa but holy houses and some of these instances in Rome, some of the most important houses or churches that we go to in Rome, like St. Clement's of Rome, very important. We're going to look at that here now. Um, where St. Um, Cecilia, her house, uh, Prudencia, Santa Prudencia, that we talked about it last week, where St. Peter used to uh, do, he would do the confirmations in the basement, the churches there. A lot of these churches were built on top of the houses where these former people lived, the, these important people of Rome. St. Clement was one of the popes, and his house is, you can get to it, it it's, it's, it's three levels under the current church. They built a church on top of his house. That got destroyed in the 800s, and they built another one that's there right now that's from the 800s, and that church is there today. But it all kind of follows this structure, this hypothesis that maybe these, the structures that became so common to us also followed kind of a what Roman houses would have been more like. And you see that here in this, the long, this, the one here to the left, you have kind of the atrium in the front. You go in, it's a garden out front, it's enclosed. Um, you see a bunch of buildings there. After you get, there's a little neck there, and then you have the, there's a, there would have been a bell tower. Then they would have had uh, rooms there, meeting rooms, places for catechism, even out, out there, places where the bishop would have lived basic structure of our churches. Here's the inside of St. Clement's. It's when I when I take people to Rome, we, we, we always go here. You have to go under, underneath in the basement. You have to buy a ticket. But all this up here, the church was built in the 800s, but this kind of the, the altar and that, that rail that goes around it, that's all from the original church that was built above uh, St. Clement's house. Some of the things I wanted to point out in here 
is one, you have the altar facing the people. Almost all these churches at Rome, the altar's facing the people, and the bishop would have been standing behind there facing the people, and we'll get to that. You have an ambo over here. It just point. You have an ambo here, and you can see there's here, and there's one here. This is for the epistle and the gradual, and this is for the gospel. Okay? You can see kind of there's a ledge here. There would have been ledges. This is facing north. No, sorry. The gospel faces north, and that faces towards where the celebrant is, and this faces towards the people. Those three things would have been used for different... Uh, one, that's the, the, the scola cantorum. This whole enclosed area is where the choir would have been to sing. The subdeacon would have gone over here to the side. If I can... Can you see? Is there a mouse there? There we go. This is where the subdeacon would go to count, can, uh, chant the epistle. This little ledge here, kind of facing the people, that's where, let's see if I can move that, right there. That's where the gradual would have been sung. Now in the ordinary form, that's what, you can't see it, you can't see it moving. Oh man, I need one of those lasers. This one here. So what you have is you've got a little stairwell that goes there, and you've got this higher elevated ambo facing away from the people. Then you've got this other little kind of ambo facing the people, but it's lower. Then you've got these stairs that go up, and there's a little ledge there for chanting the gospel. And there's also the permanently fixed there would be for the, the paschal candle. This is where they would do the gradual. The gradual is what you sing after the uh, the epistle. And so then you have the epistle sung and then the, then the gospel. You'll find this in the, the major basilica of St. Lawrence uh, and lots of other churches at Rome that are old. The altar facing the people, uh, we'll probably get into it later too, but it's because the door faces east. So the priest is looking out the door facing east. Mass is always said facing the east. And so the people would turn at a certain point and they would all face the east. So now we talk about the priest turning his back on the people. Then the people used to turn their back on the priest. And he would say, and he would offer mass because they were all facing the east. It had nothing to do with the back and people turning backs to each other. Humanism wasn't a problem back then. It's a problem now. They were all facing east as they learned to do from the apostles. Something we've broken with as of late. That's St. Clements of Rome. Just to give you an outside, this, uh, the, the colored picture, that's the, uh, the atrium area. You go in there. When they would have had the mass of the catechumens, everybody would have been inside. Then when they had the mass of the faithful, uh, the catechumens would have come out here. And they, had, you know, they would have had catechism class. They would have had talks on different things. Um, but they wouldn't have participated in the rest of Mass. They would have been being formed. Mass was so sacred and holy that only those who were, uh, who were baptized and in a state of grace were allowed to participate in the Holy of Holies Mass. A bit different than, than the way we think of it today, but it's not, it's not wrong the way we think of it today, not to say that. It's, um, but they took it very seriously, being in our Lord's presence. This is St. Peter's, just to give you another perspective. If you're interested in it, uh, if you look around, you, you might be able to find it. There's a virtual tour that I found before leading a pilgrimage there a few years ago. Uh, you can find a virtual tour of what it was like in the old St. Peter's. They tore it down mostly because they just wanted a new church, but they said because the structure was falling down, but it doesn't seem that it, that was that. Very interesting how I could go into a lot of detail here, but I just wanted to show it to you. This really is more kind of a Roman house style of the interior. So let's take a break, and we'll come back and talk about um, Latin. But first, if you have any questions, I know I'm just kind of hitting stuff. I just want to put little things together, and it's not as exciting as some of the theology, but I don't feel like I can just skip the stuff either. Do you have any questions? Yeah? Uh, you talked about the cross. Uh, in our church, we usually talk about a crucifix. Protestants talk about the cross. It doesn't matter. 
Well, I mean, if you, if, if you know that you're dealing with Protestants that, and there has to be that distinction, then make the distinction. But I just presume everybody knows we're talking about a crucifix. But liturgically, crucifixes, as we know them today, didn't start really coming into really the 1200s, 1100s, maybe a little bit before that too. Before you didn't have, you didn't have a, a suffering Christ on the, court, on the cross the, the, with the drooping arms and uh, you had a glorious Christ or a risen king on, on the cross or a lamb. You'll even notice, uh, you don't see it with the last few pontiffs. You did see it with Pope, Pope Benedict, but even like his, his crozier, which is a cross, there's, no, there's not supposed to be a body on that cross. He's supposed to be that body for us. Uh, but that also probably goes back to when the cross didn't have a body on it. So no, when we say cross liturgically, we know what we're talking about. Um, we mean crucifix. It should be a crucifix. Now it has to be a crucifix made of, well, I don't know about now, but you know, at least liturgically before a lot of the changes in the last so many years, it was always to be a fine sculpted crucifix of the, the cross should have been of wood and it should have been, um, well, I don't want to mess up. I might be forgetting something because it, it seems to me like it's, it's supposed to be of metal too, but uh, I, I want to check that. I'm, it's slipping my, my mind right now, so I don't want to say definitively anything. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Okay, so what should, yeah? I think it's called the Incredible Catholic Mass. No, I think she's talking about that priest book. The Hunted Priest. Oh, The Hunted Priest by um, Father John Jared. I think, I don't know if Tan sells it. I think maybe Tan sells it. The Hunted Priest. Father John Jared. SJ. SJ. Okay, let's take a quick break, and then we'll... I think they have cookies back there for the feast day of St. Joseph. So take, take a cookie. Mm.